I just want to take a little bit, figure out who's here. How many athletic trainers do we have here? Okay. How many athletic directors? And then parents, coaches, recreational professionals, a little bit of everything? Okay. For the athletic trainers who are in here, I'm going to apologize a little bit. Most of this will be review. For everybody else, I think you will get a lot out of this. So what we're going to start with is just what you're going to come out of this with. Basically, we're going to, you should be able to dispel most of the common myths that you're going to see or hear when it comes to concussion management. You should be able to recognize concussion symptoms, even in somebody who does not display obvious concussion symptoms, and know what to do when you do see a concussion occur. And you should be able to assist in the administration of a graduated return to play protocol. So we're going to start first with the myths. These are some of the things that I hear countless times over the years, whether it be from parents, kids, and in some cases, even physicians. Most of you have probably also heard these. One of the first ones that you can hear is that you need to be knocked out to have a concussion. I can't tell you how many times I've had a parent tell me that my son was knocked out, not knocked out, or my daughter was not knocked out. They can't have a concussion. So that's one of the biggest myths that is out there. Luckily, with all the concussion education, that seems to be a myth that is not quite as widespread as it used to be. One of the largest ones is that helmets prevent concussions. How many people here, before you sat through something like this, think that a concussion can stop a, a helmet can stop a concussion? That's good. This is an educated audience. I have parents who walk in with a helmet and they say, I bought the concussion proof helmet. The study says this one's concussion proof. My son's going to wear this for football. Or they say, my son can't have a concussion. He is wearing a concussion proof helmet. There is no such thing as a concussion proof helmet. Helmets were designed to stop skull fractures and focal blows that cause bleeds in the brain, which they do exceptionally well. But they were not designed because of the way our anatomy of our brain is, which we'll talk about in just a minute. They can't stop concussions. If they are properly fit, they can help to reduce a little bit, but they are never going to stop all of concussions. One of the things that I hear from parents frequently now, because of all of the publicity with the NFL and the brain bank and what you're going to hear Dr. Stern talk about later is CTE. I hear parents say either I don't want my child playing a collision sport or as soon as they get a concussion, their first question is, oh my god, are they going to get CTE, the chronic traumatic encephalopathy. They know that head trauma contributes to it. They're just not sure how. So there's no need to worry that when your child sustains one concussion that it is going to lead to CTE. It may be cumulative head trauma. It may be subconcussive head trauma. It may be concussions. It may be all of the above. So that's one of those myths that if you do have a parent who's worried about that, that you can dispel to some degree. Another one of the things that you hear in a lot of, I've had parents tell me, well, my, my daughter can't get a concussion playing soccer, or my daughter can't get a concussion playing basketball. A lot of studies now are starting to show that while more boys, the, the number of boys that get concussions are larger, the frequency which which athletes get concussions, the girls get more concussions than boys more frequently. Boys play collision sports. Hockey, their lacrosse is full contact, whereas girls' lacrosse is not. So just keep that in mind. Just because somebody's a girl and not playing a collision sport doesn't mean that they can't get a concussion. Another one, anyone ever see the mouth guard it's going back a few years that had, you know, may prevent head injuries on the mouth guards. You had kids showing up with the shock docks or whatever other ones saying, this is my concussion proof mouth guard. Again, there is no study that proves that a mouth guard can prevent a concussion. So they can spend the $6.99 on the cheap moldable one rather than the $80 one that they think is going to prevent their concussions. They should still wear them because it's going to protect their teeth, their jaw, but not going to help with concussions. This next one, with everybody needs a CAT scan when they sustain a head injury, this is one of those that's coming into play in more and more hospitals. Because of CAT scans and they expose children to radiation, some CAT scans expose children to radiations equal to eight months worth of background radiation. So they're trying to minimize how much radiation they expose children to. So they're trying to do less and less CAT scans. Now a CAT scan does not show a concussion. So when a parent shows up and says, the doctor said, I, my CAT scan's clean, I don't have a concussion, that is an erroneous statement. CAT scans, you're looking for bleeds. Bleeds are rare in athletics, luckily. So, and there's a certain criteria. Most hospitals, the hospital system I work for uses children's algorithm now, but they have specific criteria that if you meet that criteria, you need a CAT scan. Things like protracted change in altered states of consciousness. They're confused 
protracted <coughs> vomiting, things like that, severely worsening headaches. Those will probably get you a CAT scan. But the more subtle symptoms of they have a headache and they're just a little dizzy, most of the time won't. And the physician, obviously, your physician or the ER physician is the one who's going to make that decision. But just know that if it's your child or an athlete that goes in, it doesn't mean that they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're trying to help protect your child because the child does not fit the criteria for a CAT scan. And this is the one I can't tell you how many times I hear. Concussions are no big deal. If a child sitting in my training room who can't figure out where they are or what day it is, and I have a mom or a dad say, oh, that, that's not a big deal. I've had five of them. I played through them. I never stopped playing. All of you here, I'm probably preaching to the choir, concussions are a very, very big deal. You need to pay attention to them. They can cause further injury, and we want to keep our athletes as safe as we can. And the last two, the first, you have to hit your head to have a concussion. How many people think that you have to hit your head to have a concussion? Good, we have a good audience here. I actually had a physician within the last five years tell an athlete they got hit in the face, they can't have a concussion. And another one tell an athlete that they got hit in the body, they couldn't have a concussion. And I'll have coaches all the time when I ask what happened to a kid, if I come out to the field, I say, what happened? And they say, well, they've got a headache, they fell down, but they didn't hit their head, so I don't think they had a concussion. I probably hear that once or twice a week. You can get hit in the body, all you really need to sustain a concussion is a rapid movement of your head, an acceleration, deceleration of the head. So always keep that in mind, that it does not require a blow to the head. And that's one of the biggest things trying to educate the public, that just getting hit in the body. I've actually seen a concussion. A child went up for a layup, had her legs taken out from underneath her. She landed flat on her butt with her feet out straight and gave herself a concussion, just from the shock going up her spine. So just try to keep that in mind. And then one of the other things that I hear a lot is, well, they're not confused, they can't have a concussion. Most of the time I'll hear this from a parent when I'm trying to explain that they probably have a concussion. Only about 57% of concussion, diagnosed concussions, confusion was actually present. So you just want to keep that in mind, that confusion is not one of the symptoms that has to be present. So what is a concussion? This is the medical definition taken from the concussion and sport group. It's a complex pathophysiological process affecting the brain induced by traumatic biomechanical forces secondary to direct or indirect forces to the head. So what does that mean? Basically means somebody gets hit in the head or the body, their head moves rapidly, and their brain is injured, <coughs> excuse me, and they have a chemical process or a metabolic process that goes on in the brain which causes the brain, their brain to dysfunction or have a dysfunction or malfunction. The biggest thing to remember when we're talking about concussions is that it is a brain injury. This is one of those things that trying to get across to people, a concussion, when you call it a concussion, they say, ah, it's no big deal. If I tell a parent it's a brain injury, it is a big deal. There was a study done up in Canada that they actually told parents, some parents that the child had a concussion and some parents that the child had a brain injury, and the children of the parents who were told it had a brain injury were treated much more conservatively and they actually followed the physician's directions. So just keep that in mind that it is a brain injury, albeit it's mild one, but it still is a brain injury. The other thing we want to remember is that it's functional, not structural. People say all the time, I had a CAT scan, I had an MRI, they don't have a concussion. That's looking for bleeds. You can't see, they don't have the technology yet widely used so that they can say, look, there's the dysfunction in the brain. What happens with a concussion is basically, think of it as the nerve connections and the pathways get disrupted so your thoughts can't get from point A to point B. That's the easiest way to think about it in the right fashion. The symptoms are usually rapidly onset. They come on, you get hit, but it's not always. The other thing to remember with this is that not all symptoms are evident. Sometimes you have to go looking, and we're going to talk about ways to go looking for them later. And sometimes they take a little while to show up. So you can't just look at somebody three minutes after they get hit and say, oh, they have no concussion symptoms and let them go off. Because they may still have a concussion, you just have to monitor them. Most concussion symptoms resolve in, depending who you read, anywhere from seven to 14 days, somewhere in there. But some studies indicate that about 10 to 20% of the population of people who sustain concussions may actually have symptoms for weeks, months, or years. So you just also want to keep that in mind. Most people, luckily enough, 80% cure uh, clear really quickly. So what causes a concussion? Basically, as we talked about earlier, it's a blow to the head, face, or body that causes a rapid acceleration <coughs> or deceleration. Think about a Poland Springs bottle 
a bottle like this if there were a lemon wedge in this, okay? Skull is your outside. The fluid is the fluid in your head that holds your brain. The lemon piece is your brain. When your head moves back and forth, this is what happens. You're taking that lemon or your brain and bouncing it off a hard rock solid object. What happens in that is you can damage the brain where it's either hit or just from the movement within the head, those little pathways kind of get stretched and sheared and cause a basically a chemical reaction so that your brain doesn't function properly. And one of the other things that you want to think about with this is we all think in a lot of cases, you think of hitting your head as this way. You hit straight forward, you hit straight sideways. One of the things that they've found over the years, and this is something to pay attention to, especially in sports like soccer, football, where there are collisions, and even basketball, an angular velocity is worse. If you're trying to think about what an angular velocity is, this is something we probably have known for years and we don't realize it. If anyone in here has ever watched boxing, think about when you watch a boxing knockout. Very rarely do you see somebody go jab, jab. Most of the time they come from down here, they come up across, they cause their head to angle and turn back. So you're causing a rotary force on that brain, which puts more stress on the tissues that hold it in the pathways and cause more damage. The other thing you have to remember, it takes much less force in an angular direction. So a hit that you look at in football and you'd say, if it came straight on, and you'd say, ooh, that's something that may be an injury. If it's coming from the side, it may not be. It may not be something you even think twice about. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind. And this, I'm just gonna, this is a YouTube video. I just wanna show you two different videos. I hope, it's got a couple of NFL clips in it, so I hope I don't get in trouble for doing this. <laughs> this is one of those things that if you see this happen, there is gonna be absolutely no question that someone was injured on this. It's just gonna take a second to buffer and catch up. And I'm just gonna show you a few of these. No one in this room would watch one of these hits on their youth field and say, ah, they're fine, they can get up and they can keep going. I'll show you one, the net one more. And if you look, most of these seem to be coming from the side. If you ever, if you wanna watch this video, it's big hits on YouTube. It's insane the hits that they're sustaining in this video. So what happens here just have to get to the next one. The YouTube is not cooperative. So in those videos, I don't think there's any question the person was injured. I'm gonna show you this video. This video is from a high school football game. It's one of my high school football games. Someone on this field sustained a concussion significant enough. He didn't say anything initially. He finished playing the next probably eight minutes. On his walk back to halftime, he was so confused and realized he was in trouble, he went into full-scale panic. By the time I saw him, he wasn't sure what happened. He didn't know he had played half of football. So I just want you to take a look at this video and tell me if you can see where the athlete gets the concussion. I'll play it through twice for you and then I'll give you a hint. And this is the reason I'm showing you this is because this is what frequently will happen in high school sports. Those, those of you who coach it or the athletic trainers here can tell you. Okay, now I'm gonna give you a hint. The, the guy who gets a concussion is in white. Nope. I'll show you. I'll explain on the next one. Okay. 56, was it 56? It's going to be the center. He's going to come through the middle of the field, and he's going to end up right here. He gets hit by this guy, and who I think is the um, outside linebacker. He's going to have black sleeves on. He's right here, he's right there, see him? He pushed, now watch him, he grabs his head right there. The only sign of concussion that this kid showed, he grabbed 
one hand, and then a second later he grabs with both hands and he lets go and he goes back to the huddle. Now, on this particular play, the very next play, he's the center. He went, um, ball started after that. First time he'd ever done it. We're nine games into the season. That should have, could have also been a key, but because no one saw this. I was standing on the field watching the game. I never saw it because you can't see anything happen. So this is one of those things that, for those of us who are athletic trainers, can be a little scary at times because you have this happen. So this is why you have to sometimes be a little bit of a detective. That athlete comes off, let's say he false started three times, now you're starting to think, eh, not usually of him, let's go. So why is it so important? It's important for many reasons to recognize concussions, but one is so that you can prevent further injury and possibly death. Has anyone here heard of second impact syndrome? Second impact syndrome is one of those things that's still debated in the medical community. Some people believe it exists, some don't. I think most of the stuff I've read, more people are leaning to the fact that it does exist. Luckily, it is a very rare occurrence in sport. However, it does happen. I personally know of somebody whose cousin it happened to, whose mom was a nurse, and they let him go back to play football down in Arkansas or Alabama with symptoms, and now his claim to fame is he can sit up and smile. So those is the, that's the more scary version of this, but I like to talk about this because this helps people to at least pay attention. What had, most of the time it occurs to kids under 18, although I think the oldest I've read is 23 is the oldest person that they say has suffered from this. This occurs when somebody has had a concussion and they still have symptoms. They go back on the field before the symptoms are resolved, they take another hit. And I've watched video of different, there's two videos. There's a Preston Plavetti's video on, and there is a uh, Brandon Schultz video on the CDC website that show the hits that cause the second impact syndrome. They were bumped. They weren't even hit. Very hard. P Preston Plavetti's was hit a little harder, but his initial one was not. So what you're looking at, when they get hit like that, it causes a dysfunction in the brain. Basically, the brain can't regulate its blood flow. All the blood rushes to their head, it doesn't come out of their system, it's in their circulatory system, but it distends the brain a little bit. Hard skull, big squishy brain getting bigger and bigger, puts pressure on the brain and can cause brain damage or death. Again, luckily it is very rare, but this is why we want not to put kids back on the field. And one of the best comments from one of the videos that I watched was in this particular thing, is that he should have listened. He's co that both kids are now coherent enough that they can speak. They should have paid attention to their, their symptoms. They should have never gone back on the field because they believe that if they hadn't, they wouldn't be where they are today. <laughs> so the other things, and the more common things are, you're gonna decrease the chance of prolonged symptoms. When you have an athlete who gets a concussion and then they get another concussion right on top of it, it tends to make those symptoms longer. I, I've seen a couple of athletes, one in particular he was a basketball player, he hit his head and about five minutes later hit his head again and I, it took <coughs> him a year to come back. So you see that frequently, or kids who had a concussion, they go back too early. So that's why you wanna notice when they have one. They're more likely to be re-injured and their subsequent concussions are frequently more severe. So you just wanna try to help keep these kids, you want them to stay out as little as possible and you don't want them to hurt themselves. So that's the reason we wanna do that. And if somebody's having multiple concussions, if they're not telling you, if some kid, I have several children at school who have said they had four or five concussions and never told anyone. So by the time I see them, they're on concussion number six. That's a much more significant thing than if they're on concussion number one. Because multiple concussions have been shown in times to lead to things like depression, anxiety, cognitive problems, memory issues, even chronic symptoms such as headaches. So we want to be able to keep track of how many concussions they have so that we know if they're getting them easier or <coughs> if they're getting way up there in numbers. So this is, most of you have probably seen this. These are the symptoms. This is what the athlete may report. How many people have had in here have dealt with an athlete or a child that has had a concussion? How many of them were honest that they had symptoms without having to drag things out of them? Not very many, it's difficult. So what we find is one of the problems with trying to figure out if someone has a concussion or not is we're going by subjective data, what they tell us. If they don't tell us they have symptoms, unless they're walking around like a drunk, we may not notice. So we're gonna talk in this next slide about ways to figure out whether they have a concussion. But just remember, if they have any one of these symptoms, they're suspicious after a blow to the head of the body, they're highly suspicious for a concussion and they should be sat out and checked out by a medical professional. Simple things like headache, which about 89% of the people who have concussions have, nausea and vomiting, loss of con consciousness we talked about, 
only common in about 10% of the population, groggy. A lot of people don't realize emotional. Kids who are either telling you they're sad or they're angry or they're uptight, that's another one of those things you want to pay attention to. They're complaining about balance issues. Another real sensitive one that I've had, parents that they don't recognize and they come in later and they say, ooh, I didn't know. They, kids were sensitive to light or noise. They stopped listening to their music really loud. They turned it down. They were in the car on the way home from a game and asked their parent to turn the radio down. But at the time, the parent didn't realize until the kid woke up the next day with different symptoms. You know, your standards of dizziness, confusion, most of us are going to recognize anyways. Vision disturbances is another one. There are rare, there are some athletes who their only symptom will be a vision disturbance. I had an athlete who, this year who had a, was hit in the head playing basketball at the freshman <coughs> level. The headache and was dizzy for about 10 minutes. Two hours later, her only symptom was blurry vision in one eye, and it lasted for two weeks. But that was her only remaining symptom. So if you have an athlete who's been hit, A, you want to have them check their eyes checked out to make sure it's not retinal. But two, it could be a sign of a concussion. And then the amnesia, the lethargic, ringing in the ears, and sleep disturbances. If you're dealing with younger kids, some, sometimes even high school kids, but the younger kids, if anyone ever tells you they were hit and they don't feel right, they can't tell you what, they don't have a headache, they may not be dizzy, but they just don't feel right, take that to mean they may have a concussion. Because there's a lot of kids, when I ask what's wrong, they say, I don't know. They can tell me everything cognitively I need them to. They say, I just don't feel right. They can't explain it. So take that to mean that they may have one, and that's somebody who needs to really be looked at. So now let's get into the how do you figure it out as a coach or a parent. Basically, you kind of have to be a detective. You have to spy on them a little bit. I stand behind my athletes if I see someone that's hurt or has been hit that I'm not so sure and watch them. Some of the easy things are they're slow to respond. They're going to answer you in a much slower manner. They might be look, not paying attention. They might be looking at the ground. They may not answer appropriately. For those of you who deal with high, high school oh, teenagers, teenagers, I know this sounds funny a dazed appearance because they tend to stay looking dazed all the time. Mm -hmm. But they look more dazed than usual. They have that deer in the headlights look. They're staring off into things. Those are some of the things that you're going to think. Personality difference is a big one. You'll have kids who are normally docile, calm kids who are angry, but even more, you'll find a kid who fights you on tooth nail, Everything that happens. You want to put a Band-Aid on their finger, they're going to argue with you. And you start looking at them for concussion symptoms and asking, and they don't argue one bit. They just stand there and say, uh-huh, yes, no, yes. Those are the things you're going to look for because that will happen frequently. They might play differently. A kid who's normally sticking their head in there, they're the last guy on the pile in a football game, no matter whether the tackle was five minutes ago, they're still piling on. Now all of a sudden, they're standing back like this and they're watching. When everyone's celebrating a touchdown, instead of jumping up and doing the chest thumps, they're standing away. If they're a soccer player, they won't head the ball. They won't go up for a ball. They stay away from people. They move like this if they see. Those are some of the things you want to look for. And these are all things I have seen multiple times on the field while trying to determine whether an athlete has a concussion or not. They may have difficulty with directions. They can't follow even simple directions. They think they can, but you tell them to do two things at once, and they can't do it. One of the other things you'll see, has anyone here ever seen anyone just randomly start crying that's had a concussion? <coughs> Athletic trainers have. There are athletes that you literally will walk up to and they're bawling their eyes out. And when you ask them what's wrong, they can't tell you. They have no idea. I, what's wrong? I don't know. Did something happen? I don't know. Why are you crying? I don't know. That's a very big sign for concussions. And you'll find with kids who are suffering concussions, a lot of parents will tell you the same thing. Their kid's now crying for random reasons and no reason. They're far more sensitive. So it's another one of those subtle symptoms. They might move clumsily. If somebody's moving clumsily, most of the time they have enough other symptoms that they're going to realize they're in trouble and tell you about that. One of the more subtle ones, sleep pattern changes. If a child sustains a concussion and then all of a sudden the next day, maybe you don't know, they, they hit their head, but you're thinking, ah, oh, they're fine, they don't have any other symptoms. Sometimes they can't fall asleep, they sleep much longer or they sleep much shorter. So just keep that in mind. If a kid is all, all of a sudden telling you they can't sleep and they're normally an eight hour sleeper, maybe it is due to that blow to the head that everybody thought wasn't such a big deal. And then one of the other things too is that avoiding the groups and the noise if you have athletes who tend to normally be with all the, the kids, with all their friends, 
when they have symptoms, they tend to stay away. You know, you put somebody in a gym, most of us who are in it all the time, you don't think about it as loud, but to somebody with a concussion, the fluorescent lights and the noise is enough to overstimulate their brain and give them a lot of symptoms. So they'll avoid that, they'll stay away from it. They might stay in the door, they don't go to the game. Those are some of the other things that you wanna think about. And then there's the simple things, they have something happens in a game, like this athlete did, he false starts for the first time. You don't think of it as a big deal. The center fall starting is a little odd, but still it happens. But had that happened a couple more times, maybe one of us would have looked and said, ooh, maybe there is some, maybe something did happen. Maybe we should ask him if he's okay. So you just want to think about those. And sometimes I know as a coach, you're busy coaching your team, you might be the only one there, but it is really important that when you see an athlete who has sustained a significant blow, or even just looking around in general to see, or if you see any kids that these symptoms appear, just because you didn't see the hit, and just because they're not telling you they have symptoms doesn't mean they don't. So it's really important that you pay attention to all of these. So nice, easy stuff. What do you do if you suspect a concussion? First thing is you immediately remove them from play. The adage from the CDC is when in doubt, sit them out. If you have any inkling they have a concussion, if you have any doubt that they have a concussion or not, they need to sit and be clear until they are cleared by a medical professional. That's gonna keep everybody safe, including you. The other thing you want to do is tell the parent or guardian, because even something that you think maybe wasn't a significant blow, maybe six hours later they develop symptoms. So you want the parent to know what they're looking at at home. If it's a teenager, the teenager yelling at mom or dad may be a very common thing when mom tells them to do their homework, but maybe it's a sign of a subtle sign of a concussion. So you want that parent to be able to look for that, even if they're a youth athlete. You do not want to leave them alone. And I really, really, really strenuously state this. I had a soccer coach one day who a kid got hurt. They sent him to find me by himself. 30 minutes later, someone shows up in my training room asking where Billy was or whoever it was. I hadn't seen him. We had to go look for him. It took us 20 minutes to find him. He was in the back parking lot of the school, wandering around trying to find me. And he thought he was looking for my athletic training room. So please don't leave them alone because even if you think they're okay, they may get confused. Don't let them go to the bathroom by themselves. You don't have to have somebody in the stall with them, but at least make sure someone's with them all the time. You're gonna monitor for worsening, worsening symptoms, and if you happen to be a coach and you're watching your game, having another adult sit with them, or even having another kid there just to talk to them and just let you know if something changes. And again, when in doubt, sit them out. One of the things from the um, video, what, there's a Preston Plavetti's video in there, and he says one of his things is, sit out one game rather than the rest of your life. And it's coming from a kid who is pretty impaired and will never be the same again. And that's his advice to everyone. One game, one practice, sitting it out to make sure you don't have a concussion or to heal from a concussion is well worth not ruining the rest of your life. Yeah, th uh, this may be like another myth, but I heard, you know, say you have a, uh, it's an away game, you have a long bus ride home, um, to keep the kid awake, not let them the re yeah uh, no a lot of people think the keeping them awake stops them from going into a coma. Yeah. What the keeping them awake does, in which you do not need, they do not suggest you do. They do suggest you check on them. Yeah. But what you're doing is you're checking to make sure they're still coherent, conscious, able to answer your questions, speak to you, to make sure that it's not. It has nothing to do with the concussion. It has to do with the bleeding in the brain because if you have a blood clot or a slow bleed in the brain, as yeah. that gets bigger and puts more pressure on it, your pupils may change, your personality may change may not speak, you may have slurred vision, things like that. So that's why they used to do that, is they used to say every two hours, wake, I had one as a 12 year old, my mother was waking me up every two hours to make sure I was still okay. So, and with CAT scans now, if they do CAT scan you, they know you don't have a bleed. But also, as I spoke about with the algorithms that they're currently using and the very specific criteria, they're pretty sure that when you go home, you do not have a brain bleed. So that's why. Now, if, you're an, if it's an hour and a half ride and the kid had severe symptoms, I would suggest just making sure they're okay on the way home, absolutely. But letting them fall asleep is not gonna put them into a coma or cause anything to get worse like a lot of people think. I have that question all the time. So, now let's say the kid has a concussion, diagnosed or symptoms, what do you do? No physical or cognitive activity. And this is the tough one, especially for parents. No athletics. That includes playground, recess, gym, playing with their friends, and anything else they could hit their head doing. I send athletes home all the time. They can't play their sport at school, and their mom or dad lets them play AAU basketball. Not a wise choice. Athletic activity anywhere is the same. 
The other thing is, is if their symptoms are still present, no video games, no testing in school, strenuous computer usage, strenuous homework or reading, those things, until they see their physician, because those, system, those symptoms can make concussion symptoms worse. You want to limit their TV watching to if no symptoms. If they don't have any symptoms, they can watch it. You just want to try to keep it limited. Nothing big, bright, flashing lights, things like that. And the physician may limit school attendance and schoolwork also. So now let's get to the gradual return to play. So this particular gradual return to play is modified. It's taken from the concussion and sports group. And what, the what a gradual return to play does is it gives you that stepwise progression to put that athlete back into the sport. And it's basically so that you can help keep them safer because you're keeping an eye on them. You're not just saying, hey, Joey, you're good, go. And it helps you to ramp up their activity to see if increased activity physically or cognitively is going to increase their symptoms. It, do not let the child go back and start a graduated return if they have symptoms. Regardless of who's telling you they should, unless it is a physician and the physician knows for sure they have symptoms, do not let them go back with symptoms. Every expert you read says there should be no physical activity with symptoms until if it's somebody who's a year out or uh, you know, six or seven months, sometimes they will do a gradual return at that point if it's just headaches, things like that. But the majority of the time, you just don't want to return them. And it's intended to be supervised by an adult and directed by their physician. So the, the way this works is you do each step in 24 hours. So if on Tuesday they do step one, when they get to Wednesday, if they've had no increase in symptoms at all or symptoms showing up, they get to do step two. If for some reason they do step one, or step two, and they have symptoms, they rest for 24 hours, see if their symptoms are resolved. If not, you rest them until their symptoms are gone. When their symptoms are resolved, you take them back a step, and you start from that step. Certain physicians will tell you to take them all the way back to step one. Some will tell you to rest for a week. My suggestion would be if it happens more than once, they see their physician before you continue their gradual return. That's what I even do, and I've been doing this a very long time. And every so often you will see a physician, most people do one step, but every so often if it's a significant condition, they may tell you to spend a couple days at each step. So you just go by what the physician says. So step one, the goal is basically rest and recovery. They're not doing much athletic activity, they're probably not doing much cognitive activity. They do not progress out of step one until they are back doing all of their academic requirements. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to be completely caught up because some of the kids, it takes them a while to catch up if they're out for a bit. But an athlete who is using academic modifications because they cannot watch videos in school should not be on an athletic <coughs> field. There's no doubt about that. So they need to be back to doing everything they're doing. So step two is basically light aerobic activity. You're basically trying to get their heart rate up. I have a formula up there for heart rate max basically 70%, but the easy way to do this is if the athlete can talk to you in a voice like I'm talking to you and only be barely winded, you know that they're under that. That's the nice, easy, practical way to use that. Most athletes who've been out a week or two aren't going to even approach that anyways. They're not even going to come close to that. They are not to jump, sprint, lift weights, do intense exercise. I have athletes who literally they walk in and they say, I was cleared to start, I went and lifted yesterday. Lifting's going to increase their blood pressure it's going to bother them a little bit. So you don't want them doing that. Pick activities like swimming, walking, biking. Every so often, I'll let a kid do a little jogging at that point if they're in phenomenal shape. Those are the nice, easy ones. This is where it gets a little bit more interesting, the sports-specific training. This, you're trying to add movement to the head and the body because you're trying to see if movement's going to bother them, if the increased heart rate's going to bother them, and if their head moving, if it's going to cause symptoms again. When you do this one, you can go anywhere when I put the time on there, it doesn't need to be only half the time, but most of the time you'll do 15, 20 minutes. Then maybe if it's a two-hour practice, you might do an hour. And it all depends how the athlete's doing. If all the athlete's doing is shooting baskets, they can shoot baskets the whole time. But if they're doing a lot of high-level physical activity, you may want to cut it down to about half. The drill should have no possibility of impact. Also, they should have no possibility if they're watching the drill either. So they shouldn't be shagging balls behind the soccer net or standing behind the hockey net picking up pucks because they could get hit in the head that way. They shouldn't have defenders. As you know, when you're dealing with kids, a defender's elbow comes up, they bump them, somebody trips, and next thing you know, they hit their head. So we're basically trying to avoid the possibility of any head trauma here. The other things they should not be is the ball person on the side of a soccer field or 
holding the football yard markers. I know this sounds funny, but I had an athlete get hit in the head. Hold, he was doing, he was a ball boy, got hit in the head, went back and ended up missing two or three weeks. I had a football guy doing a JV game. They figured it's just a JV game. He can do that. Holding the down markers, people coming at him, he drops the down marker, it bonks him on the head. And now he sits longer. So just be smart with things that you have them do. Having them be human cones probably isn't the best idea either because their teammates think it's funny, especially with little boys, to hit each other, to push each other, to bump into each other. Some of the things that you want to do with this, moderate jogging, any type of skating drills for hockey players, running drills, cone drills. At this point, you want to introduce some jumping, whether it be if they're a basketball player, maybe you do backboard touches, maybe you do layups. If they're an athlete who does a lot of cutting, you'll do side to side bounding, which mimics cutting. They have to stop, their head's gonna move, they have to change direction, they have to think. It's gonna show you their coordination to see if that's back. Uh, at this point, they can hit off their baseball softball. You can have them hit off a tee, have them hit into a net, not a backstop. Because I've also seen kids give themselves concussion, hit concussions, hitting off a tee, hits the backstop, hits them smack dab in the head. Again, sounds kind of funny, but when you're the kid who can't play for three weeks, it's not so funny. So just make sure they're hitting it something soft or hitting it out to the outfield, that's fine too. The other thing, um, for those of you, if anyone has anything to do with diving or swimming, um, they can do their moves in the water, not off a board because you worry about the impact, but we've had kids do their spins and their somersaults in the deep water well to try to get them back quicker also so they don't have to sit as long. And then the other thing to throw in at this, just start putting some strengthening things. I have them do squats and lunges, bridges, some light jumping, anything I can find to mimic sport just to make them work harder to make sure there's no symptoms. At each step again, remember, you're always asking during the activity, are there any symptoms? If there are, you stop them. You're asking them afterwards and before you do the next step the next day. When you get to step four, it's non-contact training. So basically with this particular step, we're trying to increase their coordination, we're trying to increase their cognitive load. So a lot of people think about this as we're gonna just throw them back into non-contact practice. But you really wanna put a little thought into this. You want them to have activities with no head impact, but also no defenders. But one of the other things that you wanna think about is you wanna make them think while they're doing things because you wanna make sure they can process. They're playing a sport like soccer, lacrosse, where they need to process basketball, even football, where they're processing things, you wanna make sure they can. So maybe the drills, the conditioning drills that you're putting in, if it's a running drill, you're gonna indicate with your hand which way that they're gonna run so that they have to see you visually, process it and say, okay, he's pointing right, I need to run that way. That would be a first step. Then you might add an, okay, now I'm gonna do it verbally, so now you're making them process it auditorily. And then, as even the next step, tell them, okay, Blue, you're going to go right. Red, you're going to go left. Black, you're going to go back. Green, you're going to go forward. Because what that does is now they really have to process, and you're going to think, you're going to see if they can think and process fast enough to do what they need to do. And that just is going to help you as a coach figure out if they're ready to get thrown back into everything. You know, if they've been sitting three or four weeks, it may be an issue. Usually if they've only been sitting seven or eight days, it's not quite as big of an issue. And then just this is also where you're going to increase the jumping, really get them doing things where they're bouncing, that head is moving to make sure they're not going to have any symptoms. Again, what I find most of the time, if someone's going to have a symptom, it shows up here. The first couple, it either shows up on day one, two minutes into exercising, or it shows up here. They usually get through two and three okay. And then when they get to the full practice part, you want to make sure they have medical clearance because you do not want them in any sport where they can hit their head until the physician has cleared them. And you're basically trying to help them restore their confidence. You really want to get them comfortable with being back. Some athletes are very afraid to stick their head back in their sport and bump into anyone or hit anyone if it's a collision sport because they're afraid of getting a concussion. Not because it hurts so much, but because they know what happens if they get one and they don't want to ever have to sit again. They don't like it. So you always want to make sure of that. And the other thing you want to do is think about if it's a collision sport, ease them back into it. That doesn't mean don't let them hit day one. It just means if your first drill as a football coach is to run a gauntlet drill where they run down and they hit every player on the team, probably not the best first drill. Same thing with lacrosse. If it's a hitting drill where that it's basically, if you think the drill is designed to increase somebody's toughness, it is probably not the first drill a concussed kid should do coming back. You just want to try to ease them into that. And then for step six, you're going to return them and they're going to be back to game play and normal. Now, a lot of people, and coaches included, think that when you hit step six, you don't need to worry about them anymore. 
This is one of those things for the next week or two, you definitely need to keep an eye on these athletes because they're more prone to have that get hit again and sustain a concussion. And you don't want that to have happen. And if an athlete sustains symptoms, they're a concussion again and has symptoms, they're probably not going to tell you because they just sat for two or three weeks. So you may have to watch them a little bit more. And I can tell you it honestly does happen. I had two kids this year. Within two weeks of their concussion, they were back. Everything was fine. All of their impact testing, everything that you could find was normal. And two weeks later, they had symptoms again. So. Um, I just found, like, in terms of kids, like, wanting to, to rush back or, or still go through these uh, protocols. So let's say um, there's a break of a weekend. Yep. Can any of these steps be done on their own, like the earlier steps? They're they supposed to be supervised. I, I will occasionally, like if it's a bike and I trust the parent, I sometimes will let them go home and do their biking okay. on their own. I would not, my personal opinion, I would not let them go say, oh yeah, I played non-contact soccer with my friends, just because I wouldn't want to tell them to go do that and have them go play contact soccer and have something happen. Yeah. Um, I have given directions to my coaches if I'm not there on a particular day. Here's the list of things that the, this athlete should do. Yeah. And they do it, they did, I had a kid do it yesterday on the cross field. He could do non-contact stuff. They went to an away game, but I don't want the game to cause the kid to sit longer. Yeah. So, yep. So, does anyone have any questions? Kathy, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bob Stern from Boston University. Um, absolutely fa fabulous talk. Thank you. Um, I have a concern that you're giving the physicians too much of a say in the return. Um, I think everyone here um, has had the experience of a pediatrician or other primary care physician um, who is not as aware as many other people within the system. And they're um, much too quickly allowing kids to be cleared. I agree. So I would recommend that uh, anyone else here, uh, athletic trainers, school nurses, whomever, if you think that the kid is not cleared in your mind, if the kid is still symptomatic, um, that doesn't mean they should be cleared to go. Right. That, you know, if the physician says, no, they're not cleared, listen to that. But if the physician says, yes, cleared, it's still up to you to keep the kid in a safe and um, stepwise return. Yeah, and think about it. if you're in a high school setting or anyone governed by the MIA, you have the state law behind you. The state law says they can't go back with symptoms. So, and that's why it said they never go back during symptoms. I have athletes who show up with notes all the time. They say, I can go back. Well, they were just telling their friend John over here, or Sue over here, that they still had symptoms, so I have to stop them. So you do want to pay attention to that. And the other thing is, is especially if it's your child, if you have concerns that the athlete is not right, you can always take them to somebody and your, let's just say your pediatrician does not have a lot of experience with concussions. There are plenty of centers around. There's one there, you know, you have this place in Brookline, sports concussion, you have Children's Hospital, the hospital system I work for now down on the South Coast, we have a concussion management program. So you have physicians there who have extensive training in dealing with concussions. You can always take them there for a second opinion too if you're ever curious. But as a coach and a parent, if you are ever even slightly in doubt stop and if you want if you're not listening to me go on to the cdc website and watch the um brandon schultz video but even more look up on youtube it's called it's preston plevetes p-l-e-v-r-e-t-e-s it shows footage of this it's the scariest thing i've ever seen it shows footage of this kid as a high school senior and it shows what he's like now because he went back to play football when he shouldn't have and the damage that this child Luckily, it very rarely happens, but it's one of those things that for shock value for some people to get them to pay attention to concussions, it does work. And unfortunately for this child, it's a very sad reality for him that he did have second impact syndrome. I'm a school nurse in North Central Massachusetts. We have no trainer, it's me. Um, and I find a lot of inconsistency in how the physicians do oh, this. Yeah. And the AD and coaches, boy, as soon as there's an empty sign, Yep. There, oh, well, he said it was okay, so we're off. And I, you know, they just disregard anything I might say, or it, it's just, it's not a good situation. There is a case in New Jersey that was just decided an athletic trainer. There was a physician who cleared an athlete to return to play. 
the athletic trainer in the athletic department, it was in a high school, did not follow a gradual return to play protocol, theirs like they were supposed to, the child went back and died mm -hmm. from second impact syndrome and they got sued and they had a physician note. For us in this state, we're lucky. I hold up that state law now. Originally it was a pain because it's an awful lot of paperwork for me, but I'm like, ah, state law, can't go back. Says they can't. Well, and now there's that form that the physician has to check. So Correct, which they almost never do. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah. and how do you know if they training. have the training? Right. Yeah, they don't do it. So I call them. Yeah. Yep. But you don't know for sure. I've had them, they don't check it off. I don't know if they don't check it off because they're just not paying attention, or if they don't. Our area, we provide well, see, I physicians. Right, and if you ask DPH, that's what they say, the same mm -hmm. thing. I've been at lectures with them, so.